Hello and welcome back to Christian Culture, a podcast by Lutherans for Lutherans and for anyone else who will listen, where we promote genuine conservative Christian culture in our homes, churches, and communities, and of course, in our colleges. This broadcast is brought to you by Luther Classical College, Lutheran Conservative Classical, a college for Lutherans. You can check out our website at lutherclassical.org, subscribe to our magazine, become a patron, and help to start the first of many colleges by Lutherans, for Lutherans, to the glory of God, and for the salvation of our fellow man. I'm your host, Pastor Christian Preuss, Chairman of the Board of Regents of Luther Classical College here in Casper, Wyoming. Last uh, time we, d- we discussed the term diversity in this woke mantra, D-I-E, diversity, inclusion, equity. This time we're going to be discussing the term inclusion. Once again, sounds like a good word. Sounds like a word that everyone should be for, inclusion. And if you're not for it, you must be a racist or a sexist or some other horrible word. But what does this word mean? Who and what is being included in this inclusion? And who is being excluded in this inclusion? And how, then, is inclusion being used to undercut everything that is good and holy and beautiful? How's that for a leading question, Dr. Schultz? I I pretty much gave you the answer, right, that you have to give. Um, We welcome back to our uh, show our guest, the Reverend Dr. Gregory Schultz. He is professor of philosophy at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Welcome back, Dr. Schultz, and if you could uh, give our listeners an update on on how you're doing. Well, thanks, Pastor. I'm doing fine in the Lord. How are you? (laughs) Um, I'm doing fine also in the Lord. Yeah, I think that since we last talked— um, the visitation of President Harris to our university has taken place. Um, we're still being patient with him and no doubt all of the work that he and his investigation team have to pull together, and it's Lent after all. So um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's reasonable, but I'm thinking that um, Easter Monday we start checking out with the president to see what's going on here. Uh, we're looking forward to some uh, serious help from him. He certainly brought a serious team along with him. I understand, to visit Concordia University, Wisconsin. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and they, I know they did a lot of uh, interviewing. Um, uh, that's that's fantastic. And I hope that it bears fruit um, both uh, for you, who have been unjustly removed uh, or suspended from your office, uh, to which you were called by God, and also for the good of the, the Concordia University, Wisconsin, and all the Concordia system. So, welcome again. We're going to go again to the University of Iowa website to find their definition of inclusion in order to start off uh, this conversation. So, this is what they say. We'll put it on the screen for our viewers. And if you're uh, just listening on Podbean, then uh, you can just hear my voice. Inclusion refers to a campus community where all members are and feel respected, have a sense of belonging, and are able to participate and achieve to their potential. While diversity is essential, it is not sufficient. An institution can be both diverse and non-inclusive at the same time. Thus, a sustained practice of creating inclusive environments is necessary for success. So if I've got this right, it's not enough to force a diversity of people, of creeds, and of lifestyles. We also have to affirm and respect every creed, every lifestyle that we bring into a campus. Is that what inclusion means, Dr. Schultz? Well, if it means anything, I suppose that's a fairly official definition. How about <laughs> how about if we... Um, start off by saying, I'm not sure that that we're willing to stipulate anything that's happening in that description um, intending to be a definition. So I'm going to suggest that we could approach it by saying that it is begging the question. Now, a lot of folks assume that when we talk about begging the question, you're somehow 
assuming the answer in the way you're reasoning things through. Um, but mm. actually, begging the question means to assume an entire worldview. Uh, it means to assume that worldview without letting on that you're using it and certainly not being willing to defend that worldview. So it's a, mm. it's a kind of a slide-by fallacy. Now, um, I think a good way to look at that pastor would be to say, well, of course, belongingness is a fine thing, but you have to ask, belonging to what? And then you have to ask, belonging by what means? So um, I, I knew this was coming up for us today, so I was thinking a bit about a, a particular passage from Ephesians, and I'd, I'd like to offer that since our ears are, are getting filled up a lo- an awful lot with other people's presumed worldviews with this discussion, mm-hmm. right? So this is the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2. Um, he has just reminded the um, non-Jews or the Gentiles in Ephesus that they used to be on the outside of things. Um, then he says, this is Ephesians 2 starting at 12, that you were at that time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, by the way, um, I think maybe you'd agree with me from our New Testament study, the word world in the New Testament never seems to mean just the population on the globe. It almost always means um, those in the world who are opposed to God. So that would be all of us in an original sense. We're blind, dead, and enemies of God. Uh, But it would be the people who oppose even Christ during his coming, the world, right? So um, we Gentiles, we non-Jews, were without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups into one, that's Jew and Gentile, and who destroyed the middle wall of partition the hostility when he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments in decrees. He did this, Paul goes on, to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. So this is uh, mentioning a worldview Working from Scripture, this is what you could call the worldview of the gospel, yes? So the Apostle Paul is talking about, let's say, the general phenomenon of membership or a feeling alienated and left out, by contrast. Um, But he's not having any of this mealy-mouthed, mamby-pamby sort of notion, we shall all respect each other because of what we're saying right now. Um, He gives the basis for it. And the basis for it is Christ himself. So with his incarnation, Jesus establishes unity between God and the human being. And this is surely the high watermark of any discussion about belonging or any discussion about communion or community. Um, This is uh, what, what we have in Scripture And it's my contention that when wokeness is substituted for these clear words of the gospel in Christ Jesus, what's happening is that diversity, inclusion, and equity are being substituted for God's word. In other other words, a kind of heresy is taking place. I call it, in my article, an educational heresy. On the one hand, we have Christ, the wisdom of God incarnate, scripture stuff. That's what we promised to teach at our university. On the other hand, and is the sinister hand, on that other hand, uh, we have this um, mealy-mouthed, odd-sounding, question-begging business of inclusion, for instance. Hmm. Very good. So we're talking about uh, the presuppositions behind uh, the word inclusion or diversity. Or, or equity, and uh, the presuppositions are simply not Christian presuppositions. 
In other words, if we're going to talk about inclusion, we should be talking about inclusion in in Christ. Um, I heard a talk. I think it was from Doctor uh, or Professor Kurt Marcourt a long time ago, where he said that Christianity is the most inclusive religion in the world. That is, that it invites all. And this is what we talked about last uh, last time we met. That. Christ calls all to himself. He says, when the Son of Man is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all nations to himself. He sends his apostles out to baptize and disciple all nations. Um, And yet, at the same time, Kurt Marquardt said, it is the most exclusive of all religions, because it it is exclusively in this man, in this God man, Jesus Christ in uh, the incarnation of the Son of God, in his life, in his death, and therefore in his teachings, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that then, along with what you just uh, quoted from Ephesians, is really the philosophy of Christ, right? Uh, The theology that should be behind all of our language. And if if it isn't, our language uh, isn't quite going to make sense, which is why I think um, it annoys you when I bring these uh, <laughs> these false definitions uh, to the fore and read them for you, uh, because uh, they uh, they simply don't start with the right presuppositions. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, getting into some very uh, contemporary um, uh, events. Uh, about Disney's uh, latest moves at their at their uh, parks. So Disney's diversity and inclusion manager, that is a real job, and uh, she makes a lot of money, uh, way more than we do, I'm sure. Uh, she's the diversity and inclusion manager. Her name is Vivian Ware, and she recently announced that in the name of inclusion, the words ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, will be banned from Disney theme parks. So they used to open shows and say, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, welcome to the show. That is no longer permissible because there are some people out there who don't identify as either a boy or a girl or a lady or a gentleman. And I wanted to point out the obvious here and then have you comment on it. And the obvious is that in the name of exclusion, or inclusion, in the name of inclusion, they are excluding They're excluding boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. These words, the belief that this is all there is, that God made them male and female, they are excluding that creed. So uh, how does this illustrate the sinister, as you you said, the sinister nature of uh, this, this, this term or this concept of inclusion? Right. Well, I've... I've had, as you probably have too, Pastor, people asking, so what is the, what's the basis, what's the foundation on which wokeism or call it social justice or cultural Marxism, what's the basis on which that proceeds? And I think the answer is there is no basis. Um, what we're seeing is a wholesale anarchic move. It's just anarchy. So I, I think that wokeism knows what it's against, Every time that it endeavors to talk in positive terms, it shows its um, anarchic soul rather than showing anything positive, humane, or human that it's contributing to. Now, uh, along with the Disney um, policies that were coming out this week, and uh, we know our listeners can look that up for themselves if they want to see some of the Zoom excerpts from those Disney uh, leadership meetings. This also happens to be um, the day in that we're recording this at the end of March when the White House and the president have gone ahead and said that they are in favor of not just uh, different gender identities, such as putting X on the U.S. passport, what a bit of nonsense that yep. is, instead of yep. male or female, but the White House is endorsing um, – surgeries being done to alter the sex of underage children. Lord now, um, I think that 
along with saying God have mercy, and we're saying that in all sincerity. Yes, I think that it's it's time to acknowledge uh, the demonic character of what we're talking about in wokeism. So mm-hmm. it is the kind of anarchy that you would expect from Satan. So he he has been long ago, two millennia ago, defeated on Calvary's cross and with Jesus' resurrection for all people. Um, so he is is just out to work as much harm and mischief among the human race for whom all of whom for Jesus died. Mm-hmm. Um, to to work as much mayhem and harm as possible. I heard a or read something. This was I know enough to remember it was in a, the January issue of First Things. I can't remember the author or the article title, in which uh, the author said, uh, demonic is the right term to use when you recognize that something is utterly opposed to God and his creation, but you can't necessarily identify where that's coming from. Mm. So the source seems to be rather hidden, but the expression of wokeism, of um this, this push for, of all things, altering the, the sexual um, characteristics of the, of the bodies of our underage children to boot. Uh, this is surely demonic stuff. And I, I think it's time to call it out for what it is. If people are worried about being demonized, I think people should worry about being demonic in, um, in what they're actually doing. So um, all of these comments whether they are assaults on the blessing of language that God has given us, to use a word such as inclusion for that which excludes anything having to do with Christ, but includes only things that take people away from this Savior. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's that's where we find ourselves. So there, there is no, there's nothing positive here. There, there is nothing here to be agreed with. There is nothing but a mythological foundation, and and that's what we're addressing. So inclusion is the use of an emotionally charged word. It sounds good, as you said. Mm-hmm. Normally it is good. Mm-hmm. But it's a, a George Orwell or what? A, a demonic reappropriation of that word yeah. to do just the opposite. There is nothing inclusive about inclusion. It is excluding the possibility of a high view of the human being, Mm -hmm. of respect for one another. Um, Even while they're using the words, they're undercutting all of those high values in Western culture. Yeah. And it's it's also excluding uh, the interface between uh, creation, the observable world, and and religion. Uh, And what I mean by that is that biology tells you uh, that God created them male and female, right? Just the same as the Bible, right? So as Christians, uh, we find a historic religion, a religion that actually happened in time and space. Jesus was actually witnessed by over 500 at the same time. He said, you can touch, you can feel, you can see, I am not a ghost. All this happened uh, in history on this earth. God became uh, a, a man and lived it out. What has happened uh, in the last uh, couple hundred years, and you know this better than anyone, um, is that the realm of the spiritual and the realm of uh, the religious has been simply taken away altogether from the realm of uh, the rational and the observable. So that we have this absurdity and this chaos and this confusion where everyone knows that according to science, Uh, A girl is a girl, a boy is a boy. You can measure it by chromosomes, right? You can can see it in their bone structure, so forth and so on. Uh, But that's in the realm, that's in the realm of science. That's in the realm of the observable. So where we are at with uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, where we're at with wokeism is a different sphere. And this is a religious sphere where we can believe whatever we want because uh, it, it, it comes from our feelings. And since we have so separated reality uh, from, from religious belief, we have ended up in what can only be described, uh, as you have described it, as, as a, a chaos and, as you said, uh, uh, demonic. 
Um, let's move on to uh, a quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, this is St. Paul, as he does several times, he quotes um, heathen authors, um, Greek poets, and so forth. So in this instance, he quotes the comic poet from Athens, 4th century BC, Menander. We don't have much of Menander's work. It's been lost. Um, but we have uh, this quote and another, uh, a number of other quotations from Menander from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He found it, he found it relevant enough to make it into scripture, right? Uh, so it becomes inspired because the Holy Spirit used it. That's a beautiful thing. And that is bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. So as far as talking about the diversity of creeds and of viewpoints and of sexual orientation and so forth, talking about this as a good thing, and then saying it all needs to be included in a campus environment where everybody feels welcome. Okay? Um, how does this proverb from God's word, bad company corrupts good morals, apply to that? And especially to how a confessional Lutheran uh, college campus should be operating. Yeah, um, you'll, you'll pardon a little a bit of free association here too. So... Um, that that Menander quote is is also derivative, I think, from Socrates' trial. Is that right? So yeah. So when Socrates, about the year three ninety nine, was on trial for his life, we remember those two charges of teaching false gods and also of corrupting the youth. Mm -hmm. um, and and Socrates ends up saying, of course, that you might as well kill me because I'm not going to stop teaching the young people to seek the truth. And by the way, I'm doing this for from his framework for religious motives, because the god Apollo said there's no one on earth wiser than Socrates, and I always have to prove that. <laughs> um, so the thing is, though, that in explaining how he could not possibly be corrupting the youth whom he was spending his time with, Socrates said another version of bad company corrupts good character, or in other words, um, you would do, be doing harm to yourself if you're harming the students that you spend all your time with. Now, I'm meandering a little bit there, or menandering a little, no, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, but that, that happened oh because goodness. that was Terrible the joke. last, that was actually the last text that I taught before I was yanked out of the classroom Oh, really? uh, at Concordia, teaching about Socrates' trial, where he said, you'll have to kill me rather than get me to stop teaching my students. <laughs> yeah, so um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking say, is... That's a, that's a God yeah, thing. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think what we find with that, that reminder about bad company is... Um, I'd like to say it's a matter of what you bring to the conversation with the company. So if we're bringing the word of Christ in, I would like to say that that is actually the answer, capital A, to the question about our alienation, our purposelessness, our not belonging. Christ is the answer for that. Um, the rejection of him is, I think, inevitably going to be a move of bad character. So it, it's immoral. It is absolutely immoral to be practicing your woke worldview on other people's kids or on your own. This is child abuse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's a kind of child abuse in language. If, if teachers are teaching students that they are not the boys that they really are, or are not the girls whom they actually have been created to be. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is also something else when parents are willing to experiment on their children and use them as virtue signaling in this whole inclusion business too. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing, the telling thing, is that um, to, to learn from uh, Professor Marquardt some more, there is always an inclusion and an exclusion for these kinds of conversations. In this case, 
Christ is being excluded, and all sorts of demonic behavior is being visited upon our children as a result. Mm -hmm. In the case of the gospel being brought into the conversation, this stuff is shown up for the inhuman, demonic, harmful stuff that it is, but Christ is brought into the picture, and Christ is the Savior. He's the Maker and the Redeemer. He is, as Paul said, in his own person, the designer and the peace that, that we're seeking. Now, we can probably remind our audience, too, that this notion of peace is fundamentally a Hebrew notion, isn't it? Shalom. And it means to be put back together. It means to be reconciled with God in the first place. And only in that reconciliation is our reconciliation with one another possible. So it's a it's it's the case of Christ versus wokeness and this um, abysmal attitude and acting toward other human beings, including, as I said, our own children. Yeah, the uh, I just preached a sermon last night uh, talking about raising children in the Christian faith, and uh, when we say that the children that God gave us uh, are made in the image of God. I mean, we say it so often that it just becomes this sort of like cliche. Even uh, President Trump uh, would say it, right, in, in the debates, which was wonderful, right? Children made in the image of God is what he would say in, in um, speaking against abortion. God bless him. But we say it so often that we often, uh, I think, forget uh, the implications, uh, the consequences of this. They were made in the image of God. That is, they were made to know him and to love him. That's what they were made for. So parents, um, obviously, uh, as animals do, uh, feed their kids, as animals do, protect their kids, as animals do, teach their kids how to survive on their own in the world, right? Uh, a loon does that, right? A robin does that. But we are created in the image of God. And what that means is that we, uh, the children that God gives us are to be given his word first and foremost. We're to feed their souls, give them uh, who their God is, so that they know him and that they love him aright, which of course can only happen through Jesus Christ because he is the son who reveals the Father uh, to us. Um, and uh, we should approach all education that way. Um, it makes no sense for us to be um, educating our kids about history without talking about how God orders all time. It makes no sense about uh, for us to... Um, instruct our kids about mathematics without talking about the God of all order or about biology without uh, talking about the God who created us male and female. In other words, uh, the theology of Christ, right, the philosophy, uh, kata Christan, uh, as you say, interpenetrates every single subject, which is why uh, this is the uh, assumption, the philosophy, the theology that has to be behind a Christian university. Now, what uh, I was uh, getting at, I, I asked these leading questions, and then I uh, want very specific answers. It's just typical. Well, you know this. You're a teacher. so. <laughs> but there, there's an old Latin proverb. Uh, I love it. I teach it to my uh, Latin students and, uh, and to my parishioners, everyone that I can. Fas est ab hosta docere. It's in Ovid's Metamorphoses, I think. Fas est ab hosta docere means it is right to be taught by the enemy. And... Uh, you, as a philosophy teacher, I mean, you teach people uh, Socrates, you teach people, um, uh, you know, Plato, Aristotle, uh, that we can learn from, but who are uh, can, in some ways, because they're heathen philosophers, be considered an enemy. But then also you teach people like Nietzsche, who's most definitely uh, an enemy, and so forth. Can, can you talk a bit about the difference between l giving the enemy the stage— with a megaphone, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, us talking about what the enemy teaches, critiquing the enemy's arguments and so forth. Because the one belongs on a Christian campus, the other most certainly doesn't. Yeah, that's well taken. Um, you and I are both coming from pretty strong classical backgrounds, so I'm not going to stand out here by myself and have to defend this. <laughs> I, I know you've got some uh, skin in the game, too. So um, 
How about how about if we say this? Um, it is instructive to realize that a professor can raise the issue of wokeism at my Lutheran university, and the only response that can be mustered is to suspend him. Mm -hmm. um, by contrast, um, I have no problem. In fact, um, though I don't gush over Nietzsche, I think Nietzsche is very important to teach for a number of reasons. And I'll, I'll just mention those kind of quickly here. Um, to begin with, there is Nietzsche the person. So uh, Nietzsche, though I, I grant you without any further ado that he's the patron saint for postmodernism and then by default for the poor, poorly educated person's postmodernism, which I think is what wokeism is. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the case. But before that happens, he was a man who suffered a great deal. I mean, this is incontestable. It also always catches me when I'm prepping to teach Nietzsche that he was the son of a Lutheran pastor who died apparently from a very painful um, wasting condition, practically in front of young Friedrich. Mm. So I teach my students that one reason uh, to become acquainted with Nietzsche is to, to note his suffering and his anger against God because we are going to meet Nietzsche's in our lives. We are going to meet people who, despite what all the other scholars say about Nietzsche needing an editor and so forth more than anything, what he really needed was a friend. He needed somebody who would be praying for him, who would be resolute in being there and uh, listening to his complaints against God and bringing Scripture in. Um, and uh, I remind my students that, as our Lord says, to whom much has been given, from you shall much be expected. And one of those things to be expected is to watch, to minister to the Nietzsche's, the angry, angry theists you're going to run into in your life, and, and look after them with the gospel. The second thing is that Nietzsche, for all of his um, failures, and they are legion in his writing, is also resolutely honest. So if, if you want to see what's really going on, you can go to Nietzsche and he'll tell you, right? He'll tell you that um, we have to get beyond good and evil, the categories of scripture, and that the individual is the only locus of normativity and authority. With Nietzsche, you've got somebody honest, you know what he's thinking, and you can speak to that. None of this uh, mishmash die stuff. Um, and then also in, in uh, Nietzsche's important writing, such as um, the story of the madman from gay science, uh, Freilicke Wissenschaften, mm -hmm. he points out that with the death of God in Western civilization, everything is up in the air, including the meaning of life. What uh, festivals will we have to invent, you know, having gotten rid of God from Western civilization? Nietzsche is a master diagnostician of Western culture and what has gone wrong. So he deserves to be heard. I think, though he would hate this, I gather, um, he deserves to be pitied. And and he needs to be read. Uh, finally, um, I, I know our students are going to run into Nietzsche, whether, whether they're going to hear about him from a, a, a Christian and a Lutheran professor or not. They're going to run into Nietzsche. I have stories from students in the past who have told me they've actually had friends who have committed suicide because at, at this point in life, you know, early 20s, heading into 30, um, they were reading Nietzsche and not their Bibles, wow. and that drew them to suicide. So, you know, you need an inoculation. I, I do not mean a vaccine. I mean an inoculation <laughs> um, yeah. by reading Nietzsche with your Bible open and some guidance. So yeah, that's... Uh, right, so that's that's part of this. It remains the case that that Colossians passage I've offered about watching out for hollow and deceptive philosophy, um, which is the stuff that depends on human tradition alone and then the stoikia or ABCs of this world, that's, of course, what wokeism is. And it's not a very good or interesting version of it to boot. Um, so it's it's bad stuff in any company, Right. But yeah, the, yeah. the glory of the gospel, to test out all of this stuff against the wisdom, the sophos incarnate, right, which Paul calls him in, in 1 Corinthians 1, to test this out against Christ, is 
is supremely important. I would say that the problem with wokeness and woke people is that they are so impoverished that they take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere. Um, and we need to, to reinsert that O2 so that people can breathe and talk. And that at least requires hearing the other side of things, or is it the only side there really is? And that's God's love for us. I imagine next time, um, Lord willing, when we talk about the matter of equity, we can dive into this more. But it's also the case that the things that are um, very good about Western culture and in uh, about America in particular are actually dependent on that creator God who came among us in the flesh of Jesus. So we, we lose just about everything worth having if you're going to take uh, the atmosphere of Christ and his word away and supplant that with this suffocating wokeness. Amen. Yeah, what you just did with uh, with, with Nietzsche is uh, ex- exactly what I wanted you to do, uh, just <laughs> to show that you can teach um, from... Uh, someone that we'd all agree, you know, he's 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 an atheist. He's angry against God, and therefore, as you said, an angry theist. <laughs> you can't really be an atheist if you're angry at God. Uh, he suffered a lot, but he's honest, right? And uh, also, the so, so you can learn from him still, uh, just only certain things. And also, the fact that, uh, that it is such a benefit for young Christians who are going to run into. Uh, this sort of philosophy later on in life, they're going to run into nihilism. To have a Christian uh, professor uh, show them the errors and the faults uh, of the thinker before them. And this is exactly what I think Ovid meant when he said, Fas asta posta do carry, yeah. that is, it is right to be taught by the enemy that is in, in, in a guided manner. But you do not you do not bring the enemy into your gates, put him on a pedestal and give him a megaphone to propagandize your children. You don't, you don't do that. That's like uh, Putin bringing Zelensky into Moscow and saying, hey, here's a, here's a megaphone or uh, vice versa, right? You, don't, you simply don't do that. Um, and so I find it uh, just so sad when, when, when we have uh, uh, universities uh, that would do such a thing uh, to give equal voice uh, to um, a, a view that, that would oppose Christ. Um, I wanted last time to talk about words that we can use to combat this uh, die, diversity, inclusion, equity, um, we never got to it because we ran out of time because you talked too much. At least that's what Kelly and my producer said. <laughs> um, but in opposition to diversity, I think we could say unity. That is unity under God's word. Um, but in opposition to inclusion, and I'm not looking. I'm not looking for a, a bumper sticker slogan here. I'm not looking for a, a one word answer. But to respond to the word inclusion, um, could we offer, is it possible to offer a concise uh, alternative? I think it is. And let's not feel obliged, as you say, to sloganeer with this or anything. Mm -hmm. But I think it may be the word communion. Mm. Now, um, I I teach um, a philosophy of language course at Concordia every year, and um, I I have found that the the word communication just doesn't seem to do it when we're talking about this particular gift of God, language, which is also the way Jesus has John identify him as logos, which can mean language, at the beginning of John's gospel. So I, I recommend that we think not about using language, because it's probably more the case that language uses us, and to catch the full story of language being a direct gift from God and a way he wants us to think about himself as the Logos, I think the word communion helps. Now, this could this could be um, <clears throat> manhandled and mishandled, too, I'm sure somebody will. But it, it also has that advantage of reminding us about communion with God. Mm-hmm. 
So surely what people are looking for is not some more slogans and not some disingenuous Disney official or administrator or program manager coming up with one more silly thing that we have to pay attention to, right, or we'll get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But what we surely do all sense is that we are restless. We are disquieted. Um, we are Things are not the way they're supposed to be unless and until we find our rest in Christ. So that's why I've been describing this as woke dysphoria, mm-hmm. because of the restlessness of conscience or consciousness that this sows among us. You can, you can even hear it in, in the way your university website definitions have been steering that conversation from diversity to inclusion. The first thing is very important, but it's not enough. The second thing is very important, but it's not enough. Now, finally, we're going to have to force you to do all of this because it's very important, but it's not enough just to persuade you, right? Yeah. And, and what we've got is a, is a kind of ignorant tyranny. So um, what's required is, is something that is reasonable and logical and logos and logos-like. And what we need is communion with Jesus. So the question is, how can I find that rest that Augustine was talking about? And the answer is, it is to be found only in Christ. If a person says, well, I'm going to need to test that out, we can say, well, I'm afraid you're just going to find out the truth of what Jesus says. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Um, but this other stuff is, is just, as I suggested before, there's nothing there. There's no atmosphere for the human being to flourish. You know, I, I, um, I think it would be better if somebody was trying to impose Nietzsche on, on my college curricula <laughs> than, it, than it would be this woke business because there'd be something to speak to. Yes. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. Yeah, and you can, also see, you can also see Nietzsche struggling to disentangle himself from the love the rest and the communion of Christ and what that means for his writing. Uh, but, but with this woke business, all, all we're getting is half-baked slogans and, and stuff that can't possibly satisfy anybody, even for the short term. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I noticed, I don't, I don't like doing that reaction where I say, well, this is just beyond madness what we're doing to ourselves today. It is, mm-hmm. um, but it, it also is not just dehumanizing, but it is disquieting in a, a very profound sense. And the, the crime of it all, the crime against humanity with this kind of tyranny that our, our government and educa- higher education and so forth, our corporations are imposing, uh, the problem with this whole business is that it is deliberately ignoring Christ. You know, because you talked before about Christ, as Marquardt said, being inclusive, how about also accessible, the sure. the means of grace, those scriptures? Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I I have the suspicion, don't you, that it's not not simply bad company, but it is vacant teaching. It, it's it's company with nothing to say. Versus mm-hmm. Christ, they don't want to hear about Christ. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If diversity and inclusivity means anything, I don't really think it does. But if it does, it means no Christ here, no mm-hmm. Scripture here, no sacred text, no Word of God, no Savior saying all authority has been given to me. Everything else goes, but mm-hmm. not that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. you know, Christ yeah. is the answer, and and I think Satan is right, and his. Um, agents are right to try to get rid of our attention to Christ and the scriptures. But it ought to dawn on some people that there is nothing to be had when you get rid of Christ. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He is all in all, as, as the scriptures say. Uh, uh, two things. One is that when you say, uh, when people say inclusion and they mean exclusion, then that is absurdity. It is, there's nothing to respond to there. 
Um, and then the second is uh, communion is a great word, and you're right. It can't just be a slogan. You can't put that, slap that on a bumper sticker and slap it on your car and people know what it means. Uh, this is the problem with slogans, koinonia or whatever. Uh, communion, though, with Christ is established by God and on God's terms, and therefore according to his word. And that is liberating. It is liberating to a world that absolutely needs the truth and a foundation on which to stand on meaning and fulfillment and uh, a, a future. And that is the sad thing, is that what wokeism is, besides all the other absurdities, is a pessimism. It's a pessimism um, that doesn't want the optimism of the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to give life and life in its fullness, and, if, and, and, and calls all to himself to be united, commune with him, and then he gives them everything. He gives them the world, the meek shall inherit the earth. He gives them himself. He gives them uh, uh, God as their father, all knowledge, and an eternal life. That's That's what we have to offer. And anything that would come in the way of that, um, uh, well, we need to speak against. And we thank you, Dr. Schultz, uh, for doing so. We pray that God will continue to give you the courage uh, to do so and fill you with his Holy Spirit, uh, that you may uh, always speak his word um, as, a, as a faithful servant of Christ and fight the good fight of faith. Thanks so much for being on here and uh, teaching us so much uh, today on this podcast. Oh, thanks, Pastor. Always a, a bracing conversation. I certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. Next time, we'll be discussing the third word in the woke uh, acronym DIE, and that is equity. And we'll look forward to having Dr. Schultz uh, on again to discuss. Um, thank you to all who are listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the podcast and learned from it. Please share it with your friends, with your family, subscribe to our channel and subscribe to our magazine, again, lutherclassical.org. Until next time, I'm your host, Pastor Christian Preuss. God bless you. God bless our families and our congregations. And God bless Luther Classical College.